Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium, where we're going to talk about the bias variance trade-off. So typically in regression, what we want to do is when we have a cloud of data points, we want to try to draw some curve through them, something that probably looks like this. And in these data points, we can say that the response variable yi is going to equal to some prediction, which we represent with a little hat over the response variable, plus some irreducible error. And typically when we try to train this model, we try to minimize some error. And that error is going to be in the form of like a mean squared error, which is the mean of the squared differences between the actual value and the predicted value of the model squared and summed over all data points. But why exactly do we use mean squared error so much and why do we see it so much in regression? That has to do with the bias variance trade-off. So let's talk about bias. Let's say that we have an extremely simple linear regression model in the form y is equal to theta x plus some epsilon term. Let's also say that the best value of theta that it can possibly have in this form is the value one that I've labeled in green here in theta star. Now let's train this model. And when we do train the model, we're gonna get some estimation for theta and let's say that, well, we actually got it at the value one itself, which I'm marking with yellow. And let's say that we do this maybe a hundred times. We're gonna train the model a hundred times. And each time we're going to take some value of X and Y from some distribution. And then we train the model a hundred times. And let's say the first time we get one as theta. And then the second time that theta hat is also, let's say, oh, it's one. And the third time, it's also one. And let's say all the other 997 times we predicted the same value of one. Now in this world, all of these 1000 models are actually extremely perfect models. They have no errors whatsoever. And one way we can quantify error here is with a bias. In order to compute bias, it is the difference between the average of all the theta hat values that we got during training minus the actual true value that we see here. So all the average of theta values is going to be the average of all the yellow points, which is one plus one plus one plus one a thousand times, the average is one. And the true value of what theta should be is also one that we've labeled in green. So the difference between the yellow and the green is the bias. And in this case, the bias is zero and we have the perfect model. So if bias quantifies the difference between the average value of the prediction, as well as the true value, then why do we need anything else? We can just minimize bias. Let's say that now we trained our model once and we got some theta value that's equal to 101. And now the second time we trained our model, let's say that we changed the value of X and we trained the model again. And this time we got a value of theta that's somewhere of like negative 99. And then the third time we trained, again, we're getting a new value of X, we get 101 again. And let's say the fourth time we got negative 99, fifth time 101. And so we'll end up with, let's say 500 points that are at the 101 and 500 points at the negative 99. Now, if you try to compute the difference between the average value and the true value, well, in this case, the average value of all of these 1000 yellow points is going to be one. And the true value is the green here, which is also one. And so the distance between these two again is zero. And so we would call this linear regression model still an unbiased estimator, as now theta has zero bias. But despite the zero bias, even if we take any one of these 1000 models that we train and we take the value of theta, that value of theta is so wrong that the model is just actually very bad despite having a zero bias. And so we need more than just bias here. For example, instead of having all of these data points spread way far apart, it would be nice if all the estimations were kind of cluttered closer together, kind of like, this. And so now in this situation, if we take the average of all of these 1000 points, 
we still get the true parameter one. So that means that this linear regression model is still an unbiased estimator. But at the same time, we also can pluck each one of these models or any one of these models, like this one, for example, and say that, oh, this estimation right here is actually not too far off from the true estimation of theta. And so this estimation of theta here at like four is actually still a pretty good model. And so a good model is one that has a very low bias as well as a very low variance. And so in the most ideal world, the model would have zero variance and zero bias. And we would strive to have a model with as low of a variance and low of a bias as we possibly can. However, what makes this very difficult to do is the inverse relationship between variance and bias. For example, let's say these 500 data points with the value of 101 for theta estimations were to suddenly move into this direction to a point where, well, all of these are now concentrated at say 51. Now, what happened here is that the variance now between these data points has decreased but the bias itself has shifted from one now to maybe somewhere over here. And so though we saw a decrease in variance, we have now an increase in the absolute value of the bias. Now let's say though, what if we move these 99 data points in this direction? And now let's say that here at like negative 49, we now have all of the 500 data points and now in this case, well, the variance here has clearly decreased and also the bias would have shifted back to zero and hence the bias also decreases. And in this case, since we were able to both decrease the variance and the bias, we were able to make a better model altogether. However, you can still see that this is a balancing act where decreasing the variance can somehow lead to an increase in bias. So, how do we quantify now this error? So up on this first line here, we're trying to get an estimate for theta. So hence I put a hat over here. Argmin is going to return the value of theta that minimizes this error. What I've intuitively assumed about the error is that it is proportional to a bias, it is proportional to a variance, and it's also proportional to an irreducible error. But not only this, we saw in this previous case here too, that in the first case when the bias shifted from this initial point to this point over here, it would have become like some negative shift. And so the bias would have become a negative number, but even a negative bias is still not better than zero bias. And so what we would want to do intuitively is that we would wanna minimize the square of this bias we would wanna minimize the variance. And we'd also, well, we can't really do much about the irreducible error though. And so the squared bias can be represented in mathematically in this way, the same thing about variance, and then we have an irreducible error. And with some simplifications, you will actually see that this very formulation is going to lead to this mathematical form, which is exactly what is the mean squared error. This means that if the regression model has a training objective of the mean squared error, the mean squared error includes both the bias and the variance. So when we're minimizing the mean squared error, we are trying to minimize the bias and the variance. And we saw that if we minimize both the bias and the variance, we get a better model as we get better estimations for the value of theta that become closer and closer to the true estimation right here. Now, typically what you would see in many resources is that you have this loss function and you would try to decompose it into its corresponding bias and variance constituents. And you can see this for several loss functions too. I encourage you to check this out. So I hope all of this made sense. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you shortly with another video. Bye-bye.